Okay. I want to first discuss a little bit about the timeline of uh, what's happening since Lord Krishna's appearance. Um, so when Krishna came, that was just over 5,200 5, or so years ago to the modern day. So he appeared around about 3,228 BC and he was on this planet for 125, 126 years. Um, when he left, um, when the sun leaves, darkness comes. When Krishna leaves, Kali Yuga entered. Although Kali Yuga was halted by a thousand years because of the 88,000 sages at Nemi Sharanya who did a yajna to stop to halt the effect of Kali Yuga. But when they stopped, um, Kali Yuga came in and um, progressively life became uh, very difficult as because of Kali Yuga and uh, different vices set in. Um, and in due course of time, the Vedas were used, especially by the Brahminical class, uh, to exploit um, exploit animals mainly. They were doing animal sacrifices in the name of the Vedas, but actually it was to satisfy the tongue. So at that time, um, approximately 563 BC, although uh, there's some commentators who think that Buddha uh, appeared earlier than that, but around that time, um, Buddha came in order to stop these animal sacrifices. And in order to do that, he had to uh, effectively reject the uh, Vedic, um, the Vedas, because the Brahmins were using the Vedas on the basis of the Vedas. They were performing these animal sacrifices. Anyway, after that, uh, Mahavir Jain appeared. Um, Jesus Christ came, Muhammad came. Then it was um, Adi Shankaracharya who came round about 788 AD. And his mission was to re-establish the Vedas because what Lord Buddha successfully did was stopped the um, slaughter, unnecessary slaughter of animals. So then Shankaracharya came and he re-established the Vedas, but also at the same time, um, um, the Lord requested him to preach that everybody can become God, the Mayavad impersonist philosophy. And then we had the advent of, hmm, I'm sure what's going on here. <laughs> see what you can see. Um, same as you. Oh, weird. I'm not sure what happened here, but anyway, let me just uh, redo that. Yes, okay, yeah. maybe it's the memory, it's a big file now. Okay, then the Acharyas of the four Sampadayas came, Ramanuja Acharya, Nimbaka Acharya, Vishnu Swami Acharya, Madhav Acharya, and effectively they brought in Vaishnava principles again that uh, we cannot become God, we are separate from God, uh, and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came, who introduced the philosophy of Achintya Bhede Vede Tattva, where uh, we are separate from God, but we are also one with God because we have similar qualities to God, but they're very small, they're minute. So we're one with God, but we're also separate at the same time. And what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did was he, he gave us the um, prescribed method of uh, realizing God in this age, which is chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, which is the easiest way to become God-realized, self-realized. Um, about a hundred or so years, maybe 200 years after he left, uh, actually, uh, Vaishnava traditions uh, went into heavy decline um, until the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, uh, who's um, one of our modern day uh, uh, gurus until his time uh, when he began to again revive Krishna consciousness and then his son Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati did a spectacular job in Bharat by opening many many Gaudiya Mats 
in, in initiating uh, tens of thousands of uh, devotees into the Hare Krishna movement. And then, of course, we have His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Shira Prabhupada, who spread the Hare Krishna movement throughout the whole world. So this is a little idea of the timeline. So what we were looking at today is, uh, is basically the life of Buddha and uh, why he came and how he came and the impact of what he did. So, um, excuse me. Yes. So do you know uh, Krishna has always been there? So Buddha. Did he come before Krishna or after? Because it says 583 BC. Yeah, 563. 563. That 322 is is 3000 BC, which means 5000 years ago. About 5000. Yeah. So yeah, Krishna, it's never ending. 1300. So years. That does that mean Buddha came before Krishna? No, 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 no. no. This is a timeline. So Buddha came about 3000 years ago. Krishna came 5,000 years ago. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because, because, because Krishna, according to my mind, he has always been there. Because he is eternal. Oh, he's always around. But for the Leela of this world, he manifests yeah. and sometimes unmanifests. So sometimes he's present and sometimes he's not present. He's always yeah. present. Uh, if he, he explains in the Bhagavad Gita, I am the taste in water. So as long as there's water in this world, <laughs> Krishna's presence. Well, he is everything. He's everything. That's right. In every, in every way, yeah. in human beings, in trees, in he's everywhere. So you know the the five thousand BC is yeah. a bit uh, misleading. No, uh, it's not because what we are saying, Krishna personally came because oh, okay. he manifests through his energies, but uh -huh. he personally comes from the spiritual world and he performs pastimes in this world. And that okay. uh, unmanifested, it stopped about 5,000 years ago. And when he's personally present, he brings his dham, his devotees, his paraphernalia, everything comes with him. It's like a big drama group, you know. <laughs> he comes, okay. he sets up, uh, and then the drama group finishes at some point and goes back. <laughs> okay. It'll be like that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Suresh. And Thank you. you please... Um, it's very nice when we have this interaction. I, I like this interaction. So please don't, please do that whenever you want. Huh? Thank you. So the life of Buddha, if we quickly go through that, um, and we can talk about what it says in the Srimad Bhagavad Quran about, about our Lord Buddha. So about 600 years ago, uh, sorry, 600 years before the birth of Christ, so about 3,000 odd years back, uh, there was a king, Shudodhan, who ruled over in India, in Gaia area. He was married to Queen called Maya. She had a dream uh, where she was taken away by some angels and it was a very divine place. And she had a dream that uh, a baby entered her womb and actually she told this dream to the king who asked his advisors, what does this mean? So the advisor explained to the king that this means that either you will have a, a child who's a saintly king or a very uh, famous religious teacher. So the king, um, in, in due course of time, the son was born and they named him Siddhartha Gautam. And, um, and unfortunately, the mother passed away shortly after his birth. But the king was very protective of the boy. He didn't want him to become a, uh, a sadhu, a religious teacher. He wanted him to be a king and continue with the dynasty. So he never let the prince out of the kingdom, out of the palace. And he ordered his servants, just uh, let him enjoy within the grounds of the palace. And he gave him everything. Um, fine foods, wonderful clothes. Um, the palace was very uh, luxurious. He married a very beautiful girl, but yet Gautam was never quite happy. Siddhartha was never quite happy. 
and he wanted to see what was beyond the palace. And one day when he was 29, he managed to leave the palace, uh, escape the guards, and he saw some very disturbing things. He saw a very old man hobbling around with a walking stick. He saw a man lying beside the road, uh, wheezing and coughing blood. He'd never seen these things. He'd always seen beauty and opulence around him. But this really shocked him. Um, he saw people weeping and dead bodies. Um, he didn't know what to make of it. A sage was passing by and he asked him, what is going on here? Why are these people suffering? What are they doing? Who are they? So the sage replied, well, young man, this is the world of samsara, birth, death, old age and disease. You can't escape. Uh, if you're going to be born, one day you're going to get old age, you're going to get diseased and you're going to die. Now, Gautam uh, Siddhartha was shocked because so far he'd never seen suffering. He didn't know what that word meant. And now, um, it, it, it opened up uh, something within his heart to say, hey, I want to solve these problems. Why are these problems here? So one night he um, escaped from the palace. He left the palace, he ran away, uh, entered the forest, and he never returned back to the forest, uh, palace. He lived a life of a sage, a uh, satic life, and he... Uh, went through a lot of tapasya, went to great discomfort. He didn't um, care for the clothes or the food. Uh, whatever came his way, he would eat. Uh, he'd fast for weeks and bathe in cold water. Still, he wasn't quite happy. He'd given up uh, the luxuries of life, but there was still an emptiness in his, in his, in his life. So... Um, he took what his followers call today the middle path, which was uh, don't uh, be too t uh, austere, but do some austerity. Don't eat too much, eat a little. No, no, not eat too little either. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too much, uh, too little. So the middle path, basically. Be uh, reasonable in your behavior. And one day, once he was sitting in meditation, uh, it said under a giant uh, bow tree, which is in Gaia, I believe, it's still there, Buddha Gaya. He fixed his gaze on the northern star. He attained peace of mind. He attained moksha. He was free from worldly desires, uh, lust, anger, greed. And from then on, he was known as the Buddha. And he understood that we are different from the body and the body will get sick, get old and will die. But we will not uh, be subject. The soul will not these miseries. So, what does the first become very famous as a religious teacher? And he, he also gathered thousands of disciples. He taught the principles of compassion, nonviolence. Um, at that time, people were largely <coughs> atheistic. So, he wanted to stop the Vedas from being used for selfish purposes. So, he basically uh, asked his followers to not follow the Vedas, reject the Vedas, and adopt a strictly vegetarian diet. Uh, so in this way, he saved the animals, and at the same time, he would trick the atheists into following him, an incarnation of God. So that's a very interesting thing. He, he didn't proclaim that there is a God, but he is God himself. That if they're following Buddha, they're actually following God, even though they may claim to be atheists, not following God. So what does the Bhagavatam say? about Lord Buddha. So this is a verse from the Bhagavatam. We can chant it together. Tata Kalo Samprabhate Samhoha Sura Devisham Budo Nam Nai Chana Sutta Kilkapeshu Bhavashyati Then in the beginning of Kali Yuga, the Lord will appear as Lord Buddha, the son of Anjana in the province of Gaya, just for the purpose of deluding those who are envious of the so this is in the first canto of the Bhagavatam. And this is a prediction. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that we shouldn't accept anyone and everyone as avatar of God, an incarnation of God. Um, we have, there are certain guidelines to follow 
When somebody says, I'm an avatar of God, or somebody proclaims this person or that person to be an avatar of God, is he predicted in the scriptures? That's the first place we look. So we can see here, for example, um, he is predicted in the scriptures. Lord Buddha is predicted in the scriptures, like Bhagavatam says. Priti, you have a question? Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I went... I went to um, Sri Lanka recently and I came across some Buddhist, um, like proper monk Buddhist, you know, in, in, in the whole attire and everything. Mm. And um, I came to know that they, they eat meat or, you know, they, they do practice a non-vegetarian diet. I can't remember if it was that they had or, or chicken, I don't, I don't know. But they, they started talking about something about nothing. I, I, I don't know why. Do you know why, or do you know any Buddhist who could answer that? Because it still wasn't clear to me why that happened. He yeah. said here that he, was, he came around saying, "What did he?" Yeah, so what I was, was confused. Just missing. What, you, what did he say? You're talking. I think yeah. your internet connections must be playing up a bit. Uh, can't can't make up. Yeah, what it is. Can you hear now yeah. better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. yeah, I was just, uh, they mentioned something about nothingness, but I was, uh, my main issue was here, I couldn't understand why they were eating non-veg. That's right. Even though they were looked fully, you know, like the fully attire that they had and shaved heads and everything. Correct, correct, correct. We'll look at that a bit later on, but there okay. are a number of, different types of sex within Buddhism. Some okay. of them follow vegetarianism. Funny enough, the ones in Sri Lanka don't. <laughs> Sri Lanka and um, a lot of the Eastern Asian countries like China and Japan, they don't follow vegetarian diet. And how they justify that from the teachings of Buddha, I find very difficult to understand except what they've done, there's two main sects. One of them believes that there's only one Buddha who has given the instructions. Others, the other sect believes that there, are, there can be many Buddhas. And what must have happened over time was that the teachings of the original Buddha has been diluted. So they've been effectively allowed to eat meat. But the whole point of Lord Buddha's appearance was uh, to stop this animal uh, sacrifices and animal killing. So it is a little hard to get the head around why Buddhists would not be vegetarian. It's very true. I agree with you. <laughs> Thanks, Brother. Okay, Bhagavatam. So actually I'm going to read the whole purport. Uh, hopefully we've got enough time. Because in this purport, Prabhupada gives quite a lot of information. So, the Buddha, a powerful incarnation, the personality of Godhead, appeared in the province of Gaya as the son of Angela, and he preached his own conception of nonviolence and uh, depreciated even the animal sacrifices sanct sanctioned in the Vedas. At the time when Lord Buddha appeared, the people in general were atheistic and preferred animal flesh to anything else. On the plea of Vedic sacrifice, every place was practically turned into a slaughterhouse. Animal killing was indulged in unrestrictedly. Lord Buddha preached non-violence, taking pity on the animals. He preached that he did not believe in the tenets of the Vedas and stressed the adverse psychological effects incurred by animal killing. Less intelligent men of the age of Kali who, have, who had no faith in God followed his principle and for the time being they were trained in moral discipline and non-violence the primary uh, steps for proceeding further on the path of God-realization. And we say, ahimsa paro dharma. So in itself, non-violence is not a religious principle, but it leads us to the path of God-realization. He deluded the atheists because such atheists who follow his principles did not believe in God, but they kept their absolute faith in Lord Buddha, who himself was an incarnation of God. Thus the faithless people were made to believe in God in the form of Lord Buddha. That was the mercy of Lord Buddha. He made the faithless faithful to him. So he tricked uh, the atheists 
into believing in God. Killing of animals before the advent of the Buddha was the most prominent feature of the society. People claimed that there were Vedic sacrifices, that these were Vedic sacrifices. When the Vedas are not accepted through the authoritative dystopic succession, the casual readers of the Vedas are misled by the flowery language of that system of knowledge. In the Bhagavad Gita, a comment has been made on such foolish scholars, avipaschata, the foolish scholars of Vedic literature who do not care to receive the transcendental message to the transcendental realized sources of dissipic succession are sure to be bewildered. To them, the ritualistic ceremonies are considered to be all in all. They have no depth of knowledge. According to the Bhagavad Gita, 1515, the whole system of the Vedas is to lead one gradually to the path of the Supreme Lord. The whole theme of Vedic literature is to know the Supreme Lord, the individual soul, the cosmic situation, and the relationship between all these items. So this is what the Vedas um, is really meant for. Um, but we, others get diverted because of the flowery words of the Vedas and they miss the main point. When the relation is known, the relative function begins. And as a result of such a function, the ultimate goal of life or going back to Godhead takes place in the easiest manner. Unfortunately, unauthorized scholars of the Vedas become captivated by the purificatory ceremonies only and natural progress is thereby checked. To such bewildered persons of atheistic propensity, Lord Buddha is the emblem of theism. I love this, I love this comment. Buddha is the emblem of theism. He therefore, first of all, wanted to check the habit of animal killing. The animal killers are dangerous elements on the path going back to Godhead. There are two types of animal killers. The soul is also sometimes called the animal or the living being. Therefore, both the slaughterer of the animals and those who have lost their identity of soul are animal killers. Maharaj Parishi said that only the animal killer cannot relish the transcendental message of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, if people are to be educated to the path of Godhead, they must be taught first and foremost to stop the process of animal killing, as mentioned above. So uh, this is quite important because if we're not merciful, if we don't care what is going down our throat, and that has come to us by violent means, animal killing, then what chance do we have for compassion ourselves? It is nonsensical to say that animal killing has nothing to do with spiritual realization. By this dangerous theory, many so-called sannyasis have sprung up by the grace of Kali Yuga who preach animal killing under the garb of the Vedas. The subject matter has already been discussed in the conversation with Lord Chaitanya and the Chandrakasi. The animal sacrifice as stated in the Vedas is different from the unrestricted animal killing in the slaughterhouse. Because the Asuras or so-called um, scholars of Vedic literature put forward the evidence of animal killing in the Vedas, Lord Buddha superficially denied the authority of the Vedas. This rejection of the Vedas by Lord Buddha was adopted in order to save people from the vice of animal killing as well as to save the poor animals from the slaughtering process of their big brothers who clamor for universal brotherhood, peace, justice, and uh, equity. There is no justice where, when there is animal killing. But Buddha wants to stop it completely, and therefore his cult of Ahimsa was propagated not only in India, but also outside the country. Technically, Lord Buddha's philosophy is called atheistic, because there is no acceptance of the Supreme Lord and because that system of philosophy denied the authority of the Vedas. But uh, this, that is an uh, act of camouflage, camouflage by the Lord. Lord Buddha is the incarnation of Godhead. As such, he is the original propounder of Vedic knowledge. He therefore cannot reject Vedic philosophy, but he rejected it outwardly because the Sura Dvisha, or the demons who are always envious of the devotees of Godhead, 
try to support cow killing or animal killing from the pages of Vedas. And this is now being done by the modernized sannyasis. Lord Buddha had to reject the authority of Vedas altogether. This is simply technical, and had it not been so, he would not have been so accepted as the incarnation of Godhead. Nor would he have been worshipped in the transcendental songs of the poet Jay Lev, who is the Vaishnava Chari. Lord Buddha preached the preliminary uh, principles of Vedas in a manner suitable for the time, and so also did Shankaracharya to establish the authority of the Vedas. Therefore, both Lord Buddha and Acharya Shankar paved the path of theism, and Vaishnava Acharya, especially Lord Chaitanya, led the people on the path towards the realization of going back to God. We are glad that people are taking interest in the nonviolent movement of Lord Buddha, but will they take the matter very seriously and close the animal slaughterhouse altogether? If not, there is no meaning to the Ahimsa cult. Srimad Bhagavatam was composed just prior to the beginning of the age of Kali, about 5,000 years ago, and Lord Buddha appeared about 2,600 years ago. Sorry, 2,600 yeah, yeah, years ago. Therefore, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Buddha is foretold, so he's predicted. Such is the authority of this, this clear scripture. There are many such prophecies, and they are being fulfilled one after the other. They will indicate the positive standing of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is without any trace of mistake, illusion, cheating, and imperfection, which are the four flaws of all conditioned souls. The liberated souls are above these flaws, therefore they can see and foretell things which are to take place on distant future dates. So that's the end of the purport by Srila Prabhupada. It's a long purport, but um, Srila Prabhupada really drives home the purpose of Lord Buddha how he is uh, incarnation of God. And he, he cannot deny the existence of God because he is God. But he did so, uh, he didn't acknowledge the existence of God because he was dealing with atheists at that time. So according to the time and the circumstances, the preaching is done. It's not that uh, we have to preach that God is a supreme personality, but he's Krishna, he's a little blue boy. If somebody is not going to accept that, then we start from a little different platform. Um, but it doesn't mean we ourselves reject that uh, original proposition. So Lord Buddha is regarded as actually Shakti Veshavatar, and Shakti Veshavatars are generally jiva, uh, jivas, living entities, ordinary living entities, especially empowered by the Lord, and therefore they're called an incarnation of an avatar. What was his preaching and teachings? Ahimsa, main thrust of Lord Buddha's preaching was Ahimsa, non-violence. Um, although it's not a religious principle itself, it's an important quality for those who want to become religious. So that was one of the basic uh, premises of his preaching. Um, and it wasn't the basis of the Vedas he was teaching, but just an uh, experience in material life. And second thing regarding, or third thing regarding Ahimsa was Compassion, uh, so that you know, for the poor, for uh, animals, and the flip side was the human race is going to help. So let me do something to help them. This was Lord Buddha's thinking. So he, in that sense, had to deny the existence of the soul and the Lord, because um, the brains of those people at that time would not be able to tolerate such things. Therefore, he did not say anything about God or the soul. He just ignored that concept altogether. Another thing he preached uh, was uh, don't use the Vedic injunctions to conduct these abominable acts of violence. So it's effectively rejection of the Vedas. Um, and he also never spoke of the Supreme Lord or Spirit Soul, as we said. So his point really, philosophy is beginning from the premise that consciousness is the product of combination of matter, which is a little bit what modern science says. Uh, same thing with what the modern science says, in fact. And he wanted to seek peace in um, how to end our desires, basically, end our um, acts of madness. 
and to obtain nirvana by finishing our desires, our um, materialistic desires, we actually put a stop to um, our existence effectively. That's what nirvana is in the Buddhist concept. Because they don't have the concept of the soul, don't have the concept of the Supreme Lord. So effectively, there's no afterlife. So what you do is you stop um, the cruelty, you stop your desires, and in that way, you finish your existence. No more desires. By desire, you become implicated. So make all your desires extinct. There will be no more feeling of pain and pleasure. In the final destination, according to Lord Buddha's version, is one of complete negation, avoid a zero shunya. Like um, what Prabhupada came to preach against, shunyavati. This is what Buddha was preaching, shunya. Um, ignore the presence of the soul or God. There's no question of anything positive beyond this beyond, uh, material realm. There's no, nothing such thing, no such thing as bliss or real existence. So it's basically stopping everything. So this is effectively the preaching of uh, Buddhism, which is um, to stop material suffering. But what is beyond that, there's no concept of. What happened with Buddhism? Why did it take hold? Um, because actually there was an emperor called Ashok. And if you look at the Indian map, Bharatiya map, there's a chakra in the middle, Ashok chakra. And um, this is the famous Ashok king, emperor, who ruled uh, 300 years before Christ. So about 2,800 years back. No, 2,300 years back. Um, and he was a ruthless ruler. Uh, he conquered many, many kingdoms. And every time there was a war, he would fight and he would kill everybody on the opposite side. Even if they surrendered, he'd go and kill them. Was very, very ruthless. Um, and he received it. He got a lot of pleasure from killing. One battle, his final battle actually, he observed a sage in the, in the battlefield. He had conquered the battle, he won the battle, but he saw this sage going around and giving water to those who were injured, those who hadn't died. And he was amazed when he saw that, he was uh, shocked. And he went to that sage and he said to him, what are you doing? So the sage said to him, you like to kill, but I like to give life. Your life is centered around seeing people suffering. My life is centered around giving people pleasure. When um, he heard that, there was a complete transformation in his mindset. And this is what the scriptures say, when you get contact with a sage, a saintly person, it should have a transformatory impact on us. These sages are very, very powerful. So he asked the sage, who are you? And what system of belief is this? And the sage explained, I, I believe in the Buddha, and um, this system uh, is called the Eightfold Path, or whatever he explained. And Ashok was uh, wanting to know a lot more. So he spent time with the sage, and he converted to Buddhism by the influence of the sage. And he adopted a peaceful lifestyle. And instead of fighting uh, uh, wars, he decided to uh, spread Buddhism throughout Bharat and also outside of Bharat. He spread it to countries like Afghanistan, and it wasn't Afghanistan at that time, it was part of Bharat uh, and beyond. And then on the other side, he went towards Thailand, uh, so many, Indonesia, all of those countries. And then Buddhism spread um, 
wild, wide, uh, widely in um, to China, to Japan, to e East Asia, basically. Sri Lanka, that's right. As part of Bharat, we went to Sri Lanka, that's right. And it took huge force in Sri Lanka, especially. But there are many, many sects within uh, Buddhism. And, but there are two main ones. Uh, they're called uh, Theravada, and they, they believe in one Buddhism. They follow these four noble truths with the Lord Buddha had uh, outlined in the Eightfold Path. And that's generally Sri Lanka, Thailand, Southeast Asia. And then there's Mahayan, many Buddhists, um, many, many Buddhas, that's right. There's not just one, but other self realized souls can also become Buddha. And they generally recommend a vegetarian diet, and this is too cold in East, East Asia. Of course, China is not necessarily very vegetarian, <laughs> but um, anyway. But it is it, it, pretty, you're right, it is very surprising how um, they, the Buddhists don't have a, a vegetarian lifestyle, especially those in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is a bit of a surprise. So, anyway. I have a very nice friend actually called Les, who is uh, following Buddhism. And he, he himself is not a vegetarian. So I will check with him exactly why they're not vegetarian, especially because Buddha came for that one purpose, to that, stop that the animals. That's to be Buddhist. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I, I remember the monk. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I can't hear you again. Okay. Any, any better? Yes, much better, much better. So I remember, I remember saying it's about not being attached to things and somehow connected it to the food that they were eating as well. So I was like, okay. But still at the same time, my mind was thinking, I'm sure he came down for like regarding non-violence anyway, and that's violence. So yes, it was that's right. I mean, you're not attached to becoming veggie. Don't be attached to becoming veggie. But then why are you attached? Why is your tongue attached to eating? Any, why are you causing? If you're not attached to the food you're eating, then why would you want to cause suffering to other living entities by killing them and eating that their flesh? That's hard to understand. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> So this is a little bit uh, of an idea of uh, what uh, Ashoka did. He, he... Uh, uh, Hare, Krishna. Hare Krishna, how are you doing Prabhuji? Good, you Pitamba? I'm doing very good. Prabhuji, um, I was thinking something recently. Um, Lord Buddha came because there were animal sacrifices and you know, um, they were trying to copy the Vedas. Um, but what I'm seeing today, the amount of animal sacrifices that, oh, sorry, the amount of animal killings that are happening today, mm. where you're just grabbing them from the field, putting them in machines, and then the whole machine process just runs through. I don't, when I used to go bike riding, I used to, where I live, um, there used to be a, a turkey farm, a chicken farm, um, a pig farm, you know, farms after farms after farms. And, and in, if you look at America and some other countries, um, the amount of beef and the amount of meat, the amount of animals they kill, I mean, to be honest, you, you're looking at numbers which are astronomical. Inconceivable numbers. You're Inconce right. You know, it is like God knows how many eggs are eaten. You know, to be honest, um, I think if we need an incarnation, we need it right now. You know, com um, you yes. know <laughs> if... if that's what we're discussing tomorrow, in fact, Kalki. <laughs> oh, lovely. I suppose um, that's a very nice way of um, moving on to Kalki G. Jeshi, Krishna. It is. No, thank you for that uh, realization. And Excuse me. Yes. You know, uh, uh, some people think egg and fish is not uh, is uh, non-veg. Uh, it's not a non-veg. So that's why they feel, yeah. okay, we can eat it. That's right. So they, they, they do not know the differentiation between Veggie. Eggs and meat and uh, fish. That's right. So, so for some people, fish is is not meat. Um, is okay. It's a vegetarian dish. That's right. 
That's right. There's all sorts of different definitions of vegetarian, what vegetarian means. And even within our Bharatiya culture, our own people, you know, we often come across people who we say, you know, no meat, no fish, no eggs. And they say, no eggs, why not? Well, you know, that's a potential life there. So that's why. And what are you doing? You're eating liquid flesh. You've got beautiful pakoras and paneer and things you can have, as long as, of course, you're not exploiting the gomata. But at the end of the day, um, Pitamba, you're right. What's, there was one scientist I was reading. He was saying that this uh, coronavirus that we're seeing is nothing. That this epidemic is nothing compared to what we're going to see coming from the exploitation of animals and how they are being so badly exploited. The viruses that will come from that is unimaginable compared to what we're seeing now. Prabhuji, I also remember Sheila Prabhupada, um, I can't remember which um, book it was in, um, where he was discussing with somebody about, um, about World War I and World War II. Oh, yeah. and, um, and Sheila Prabhupada said, well, if you don't like to see World War I's and World War II's and Thailand war and this war and that war, stop all this animal killing and um, this will stop immediately. And I think that's um, you know, quite an interesting point that all these wars are nothing but the living entities that were killed have now been promoted up to human life and basically um, yeah. looking, looking for revenge, I think, you know, Hare Krishna. That's right. That's right. He says that in um, Bhagavad Gita chapter of text 29, you know, if you want peace, we have to stop animal killing. You know? Yes, I think that, uh, that's exactly where I read it. I think you've, yes, <laughs> well, well, well done. Very true. And um, some philosophers believe that there are actually two different Buddhas. Um, there's there's uh, apparently the first Buddha came 1800 BC, which is about 3,800 years ago. And he established this principle of nonviolence uh, himself, how one should not uh, use the Vedas for animal sacrifice. Um, and he is actually the avatar of Lord Vishnu. Uh, and he was born of um, the mother Antana. Um, and later on, he re got his um, um, moksha, nirvana, and buddhgaya, which is quite interesting. And look at that. Nabi Hari Krishna. Hari Krishna. Fine, thank you. Um, um, Nabi, I just want to ask you. Can you say something about Mahavir? Where does Mahavir fit into Buddhism? Right. Itself, unless, because I, I came a bit late, unless you right. said something I missed it. Yeah, we sort of talked about it right at the beginning, that um, from after Buddha appeared actually Mahavir as well. And Mahavir mm -hmm. is um, not part of Buddhism at all. Uh, it's completely separate um, uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm separate religious tradition. In fact, we belong to that religious tradition, the Jain philosophy. And okay. that came from an uh, incarnation of Lord Vishnu called Rushabdev. Mm, yes. And Rushabdev, he is mentioned in the Bhagavatam, fifth canto. When Rushabdev renounced everything, went to the forest, there was a king called King Arhat, uh, who imitated Rushabdev. And he actually is the one who started this Jain tradition. Okay. <laughs> Which is um, following this path of nonviolence, but very similar to Buddhism in one sense, because they also follow, they don't believe in a supreme lord as such. Okay. Um, it's, they are, funnily enough, they're quite similar in their uh, approach. They do believe in the soul. Some Jains don't believe in the soul, but in more or less, they do believe in the soul. They believe uh, to obtain moksha, nirvana, what do they say? How do they say? Um, that one has to live a pure life. Of uh, They wear they go to the extent of where um, they would wear a mask 
uh, sort of the dog breathing, the insect, yeah. which is now what we are all doing, of course. <laughs> we all become. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason, reason I asked was because all the dates of uh, uh, Buddha and uh, Mahavir, they're both so similar. So I'm just wondering yeah. Yeah. if there's any difference. Yeah, there is a big difference between the traditions, how they practice the religion. Jains are very, very strict vegetarians. Thank uh, you. They are, uh, I mean, a lot stricter than we are as well. Mm -hmm. um, they don't eat anything that's grown underground as well. Yeah, they don't eat anything, uh, no potatoes, yeah, no carrots, carrots. Anything, anything underground. Because you're disturbing life when you pick them out of the ground. So, very austere in their lifestyle. Very, very useful. One, one question about that diet as well. Are they, um, are they like a himsa dairy? Uh, um, are they on that type of diet as well? I asked because, like, one time on a on a flight, when I asked for a Jane meal, there was it was it was dairy free. Right. Oh, really? Dairy free? That's unusual. Yeah. yeah. No, they they do have milk. Yeah. So yeah. usually, if, if you ask for a Jane thing, it's usually paneer. <laughs> Because they don't have potatoes or carrots and things, so you usually get paneer sabji in the yeah. in the in the plain anyway. All right. But but nowadays, of course, many many Jains will be following mm -hmm. this ahimsa, uh, ahimsa milk products, you know, yeah. because they do they really have a, a great care for how animals are treated. In Gujarat, you know, there's so many uh, farms and goshalas, and most a lot of them are run by Jains. They have, they have this really great moral ethos centered around animal protection, which is actually wonderful to see. And of course, our own uh, Nitin Bai is uh, Janaki. Ah, oh, Janaki's there. <laughs> great. Yeah. Janaki, anything you want to add? Um, 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 no, I, my sister just walked in and she was just really interested in <laughs> listening to everything as well. Um, so she was, um, she was just saying that a lot of vegans have actually skipped the ahimsa milk and just gone straight to uh, vegan in, in, in the way that many Vaishnavas have as well, I think. Um, so she's saying that um, there's a big, big move towards veganism in, in Jain oh. philosophy as well, including some of the gurus propagating veganism. Okay. Yeah. No more burfis, huh? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. Is, does she want to contribute anything, Jyoti? If she wants to, it's fine. Huh? Okay, anyway, I'll carry on. Uh, oh, yes. I think she, she wanted to say something. Yeah, um, this is yeah. Oh, um, hi, everyone. This is Jyoti. Um, hey. to, my no to my knowledge, um, but the Buddhist tradition had a sort of iconography that had been established, their statues of pictures of Buddha Bhagwan mm. and um, at the time I, I think most m most Jain religion at that point was Stanakvasi meaning that they didn't really do deity worship or picturing mm. God as such but obviously you know there might have been a devotional uh, desire that arose amongst the community and especially if you're trying to maintain a population amongst these you know rising uh, religions around you Buddhism was gaining in popularity Obviously, you know, the Pakti movement and Vaishnavism was growing in popularity. So um, I think from what I've understood of it is that uh, Jain iconography le um, leaned a lot on what had already existed in terms of depicting the Buddha. Okay, interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Just for everybody's knowledge, uh, Jyoti is uh, Janaki's sister. And uh, both of them are the most um, humorous personalities I've ever met. <laughs> You, you meet them both, especially together, they put the mickey out of each other and it, you'll be just <laughs> all the time. <laughs> That's lovely to hear. Hi Krishna everyone, hi Krishna. Lovely for Guruji and Um, I think I just missed the beginning, mm. but well, when these uh, personalities would the and Mahavira and they came into being, but they were transplanted from uh, the higher yeah. planet or something. That's right. So they're transplanted. They're not oh, human. That's right. 
Buddha is regarded the avatar of Vishnu. But they're like the embryo, it was transplanted. Like, uh, is that? I, I'm not sure of the specifics, um, but actually Buddha is a, a living entity like us, a jiva soul, who was especially empowered by Krishna. They were given special powers in yeah. order to be able to uh, convince and preach like they did. Jai, thank you. And that yeah. also includes Prabhupada. Yeah, a bit, bit, like, bit like Prabhupada, because Prabhupada also would have taken birth like us. But he, he's an empowered soul who, who's been given this special duty. To yes. Wish. So similarly, I think Buddha was in that same category as well. And Mahavir, also mm. a great soul. Yeah. Because he was very uh, austere in his lifestyle. Extraordinary, actually. <laughs> so. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dani. Thank you for that. So anyway, uh, just saying there's just, this is just a side point, really, two different Buddha. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. Um, but the second Buddha, 560, may not have been the real one. Um, yeah. But anyway, the reason why these two Buddhas have basically been merged into one is because Sankaracharya uh, treated them as one person. He didn't discriminate between the two. But the philosophies are somewhat different. The first Buddha, 1800s, um, did not necessarily deny the existence of God. How could he? He is an avatar after all. So. Anyway, Sankarachai then developed his own philosophy uh, to destroy uh, Buddhism. And Buddhism was basically driven out of Bharat after Sankaracharya and then the four uh, Vaishnav traditions. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much, dear Lord Buddha Ki Jai. <laughs> thank you for um, nice discussions. If there's any questions, we can, we've got a quick time for a minute, of, uh, a quick question or two, if anybody has. Otherwise, uh, we can move to the machine to cover. So, Karuna Banda, you are there. Good. good. Hello, Krishna. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so, we'd like to pray for uh, not just the humans, but the animals and the plants and the trees. Because they're all living entities, and everybody, everybody needs to go back to the God, back to Godhead. So let's pray for everyone today. Hare Krishna. Shishi Lakshmi Nashinga Deva Ki Jai, Prahlad Maharaj Ki Jai, Shabobad Ki Jai, Gumaraj Ki Jai. Nashinga Kavacham Bakshe, Prahlad Dinaditampura, Sarvarakshakaram Punyam, Sarvopadra Vanashanam. Sarva Sampat Karam Chaiva, Swarga Muksha Pradayakam, Dhyadvana Rashingham Devesham, Hema Simhasana Sitam, Divritasyam Trinayanam, Sharad Indu Shama Prabham, Lakshmyalingita Vamangam, Vibhuti Birupashitam, Chatur Bujam Komalangam, Swarga